If you're watching this video, your teachers have probably made these two concepts much more difficult than they actually are. You see, if you've heard of a bow and arrow before, and if you've ever opened a gallon of milk, these two concepts are incredibly easy. Hey everybody, Organized Biology here, where we make difficult biology concepts simple. And today we're talking those pesky preload and afterload concepts, we're gonna make them simple. And to start, I want you to know that both of these have everything to do with how much blood is coming out of the heart per beat. And depending on how preload and afterload changes, it'll also alter how much blood is exiting. So let's start with preload, but before we do that, imagine yourself using a bow and arrow, like Katniss Everdeen, right, in The Hunger Games. So let's imagine that you pull the bow and arrow back ever so slightly, just about to here. So here's your arrow, you're pulling it back, and if you let go, that arrow will likely just go like, boop, just straight down, essentially, right? So it doesn't push that arrow very hard. However, if you were to pull the bow and arrow really far back, all the way, tensing, 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 and letting go, whoops, sorry about that. You see, the further you stretch that bow, the further the arrow goes. Your heart is the same way. Look at this heart on the top. As the heart is relaxing, called diastole, there will be blood filling up the heart through veins, either your vena cava or your pulmonary vein, and it's going to fill up that heart with a specific amount of blood. We'll just say, for example, 100 milliliters of blood. So heart's filling, 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 right? Now, this is called the end diastolic volume, or EDV for short, basically saying, hey, once the heart is done relaxing, how much blood is inside? Now, in this case, we're going to have that volume of blood, the heart is going to contract, beat, throw that blood out of it. So after it goes through that contraction called systole, a lot of that blood will have exited, but there will also be some blood left over. We'll just say about 50 milliliters because the heart isn't perfectly efficient. So in this case, how much blood exited the heart? Well, obviously we've got 50 left over from the 100, so we have 50 milliliters leaving the heart. So that's a pretty good amount, right? But we've got that end systolic volume here. It's still relatively high. There's some blood left over, so we really didn't get that very efficiently, right? But check out this next example. We're gonna say that this time, the heart is really filling up well. Like there's a lot of blood coming back into it. And during diastole, this heart fills up so much, we'll say to like 200 milliliters, which is probably an exaggeration, but it'll illuminate the point. So you see, as 200 mils fills up the heart, the heart stretches like crazy, right? So what can you guess? If the heart is like a bow and arrow, what will happen when the heart contracts? Well, during systole here, when the heart contracts, it's going to pump out so much more blood because the heart's going to contract back really hard. And as we can see, we'll say at the end, there's about, I don't know, we'll say 50 milliliters left over again. In this case, how much blood left the heart? Well, you guys can do simple math. This is 150 milliliters leaving the heart, right? So all preload is, you guys, is the more the heart is able to stretch to accommodate the blood coming in, the harder it will contract and the more stroke volume, the amount of blood leaving the heart, will increase, right? Because here we didn't stretch the heart out very much and it didn't contract very hard, didn't get much blood out. But here we stretched it a lot, got a lot of blood out. Wonderful. What could affect preload? Well, I've got a little diagram here. We already got a couple skeletal muscles. And running alongside these skeletal muscles are veins that are bringing blood back towards the heart. So what's a time in your life where you use your skeletal muscle a lot? You're contracting them, contracting them, and they're actually pressurizing those veins, forcing blood to come back really fast. Well, obviously, when you're exercising, Exercise compresses those veins, forces the blood back towards the heart, fills it up more, and therefore, what does the heart start doing when you're exercising? Well, you can feel it in your chest contracting really hard, right? And the reason for that is because it's stretching a lot, accommodating the extra blood coming back, and therefore, preload increase. Therefore, our heart contracted back harder during systole, and therefore, our stroke volume increased. Wonderful. So that's all preload is. It's like a bow and arrow. The more you stretch it, the more it'll contract back, the more blood will exit the heart. Now, afterload is usually the peskier one, but I want you to imagine this. Have any of you ever opened up like an almond milk gallon or 
maybe a gallon of milk and they have those little tabs on the top right where you flip them up you're supposed to peel them off all nicely right but they never peel off nicely because like the wrapping like pulls apart from the plastic and now you have the seal it's still there but no way to pull it out you obviously have to push that thumb into the seal push it really hard until it pops right open so you get that seal right and you're trying to push it open and then eventually it pops that's how afterload works so let me give you an example here we've got a heart it's about to contract so we've got that blood in the heart resting out and we've got the arteries here whether the pulmonary arteries the aorta but i want you to focus on that artery we've actually got a valve here and these valves are called semi-lunar valves they're kind of shaped like a half moon and its goal is to prevent the blood that's all the way throughout the rest of your body going back towards the heart, right? Because of the blood that we pumped out of the heart, we don't want to come back in. So this valve basically is a one-way door allowing that blood to stay here. So as you can see, as the blood is sitting there, obviously it's throughout the body, but it's kind of sitting on top of that valve, right? Well, think about it. If here's the valve and the blood is sitting on top of that valve, well, obviously this blood is exerting force downwards due to gravity on your semilunar valves. So here's the blood, the force is pushing down on the valve, and that force is called afterload. So think about it. The heart's goal is to get blood from heart out through semilunar valves. But what does it have to overcome? It has to overcome the force of afterload, right? So in order to get blood out, we have to overcome that force with an even stronger force. Yes, because we're not going to move that blood unless we force it out, right? So inevitably, that's what happens. As the heart contracts, that blood is going to be forced outward, allowing that blood to further circulate all throughout the body. So this is exactly like that little tab I was talking about on the gallon. In order to open up that valve, that valve is the tab, right? You had to press that thumb against it really hard, and then eventually you overcame the force of the tab, and what happened? you pop through. Just like the blood here, we were contracting the heart and eventually the heart overcame that force, boom, and it popped open the valve and the blood exited, right? Now, here's the thing. I'm gonna write three situations where this afterload is really, really high. Number one is when a person's body mass is really high. Two is when the blood vessel diameter is very small. And lastly, when blood viscosity is pretty high. Okay, so why does afterload increase when you have high BMI? Well, it makes sense because if you have high BMI, you just generally have more blood. Shaquille O'Neal, for example, will have a much higher BMI than me. Therefore, he has a lot more blood than me. And if that blood is throughout his body, obviously, there's more blood sitting on top of these semilunar valves. If there's more blood sitting on top of the semilunar valves, there's a lot more force pushing back on the heart. The second thing is if that blood vessel diameter is too small. So think about it. If I have like a balloon, for example, and I squeeze the balloon tight, 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 I narrow the diameter. Well, you're going to feel a lot of pressure pushing back out on your hands, correct? So if I were to say narrow up these blood vessels... Well, now we have to compress all of this blood that was in this bigger space into an even smaller space. And what does that do to the afterload? Further increases it because we're compressing all of that blood. So the afterload increases. And lastly, if blood viscosity, otherwise known as blood thickness, due to say a high incidence of cells or platelets, that can also increase afterload because think about like a milkshake right? If you're drinking a milkshake, the blood in this case, it's really hard to get it through the straw, right? So you got to use a lot of suction force to pull it out. Same thing here. It would take a lot of force to push it outward because the afterload is so high because it's so thick. So how does this once again affect how much blood leaves the heart? Well, think about if we had a lot of afterload, right? We've got some blood that's pooling in the heart, that EDV that we talked about earlier. And we'll say that there's like 100 milliliters in here, just like previously. Now, in this case, if there's a lot of afterload, a lot of force pushing back on the heart, and now the heart is contracting, going through systole once again, how much blood do you think is going to exit? If you have, say, a high BMI or you've got narrow blood vessels and you've got really high blood viscosity. 
Well, this blood is not going to want to move, right? There's a lot of force pushing down. So in this case, we're not going to get much blood out. Let's say we have 70 milliliters here, so therefore only about 30 milliliters exited. And we still have that really high afterload forcing back afterwards. So in this case, more afterload means a lot less blood leaving the heart. But preload, remember, was the opposite. The more preload we have, the more we fill the heart, the higher the volume was that exited the heart. So they're inversely proportional. To sum it up, high preload, a lot of blood leaving the heart. High afterload, less blood leaving the heart. And that can lead to a variety of conditions, including heart failure, which you can learn about here. Or if you wanna learn more just about how the blood leaves the heart in terms of cardiac output, you can watch this video next.